In this video, I'm going to help you to develop the ability to attack high balls with your forehand. The way I'm going to do it is by showing you some of my own training, because it's one of the main things that I'm working on at the moment with my left hand. Now, I'm naturally a right-handed player, but I've had to switch hands after injuring my right shoulder in a mountain bike crash. So now I'm relearning to play left-handed, and my goal is to become a 5.0 player and then hopefully try and compete on the seniors ITF tour. I've improved a lot in the time that I've been practicing, but I still got a long way to go. And I believe the high forehand is gonna be one of the pivotal shots that I need to develop because it's something you only ever see executed consistently well at the higher levels. When you watch kind of 4.5 level and below, this is a shot that players aren't able to execute consistently. And the reason that they can't do it is because timing is the critical factor. In order to be able to attack high balls with your forehand, you need fantastic timing. It's actually something that I used to struggle with when I was playing right-handed growing up. It was always a shot that held me back. Now, a big part of my problem was that I used to get too close to the ball. The other part was that I used to hit the ball late. And as I'm gonna be explaining in this video, you need to have the correct spacing and you need to be able to efficiently meet the ball out in front. But I wasn't able to do that because I had issues with my visual system, which meant I wasn't very good at judging distance and depth. And I also had certain limitations with my coordination and that made the sequencing and using my kinetic chain efficiently very problematic. So before I was able to start to really attack high balls uh, at a high level on my right hand, I had to fix both my visual problems and my coordination. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about how I did that towards the end of the video. What we're gonna do is start by talking about kind of the key technical elements that I'm focusing on and how I'm structuring my practice session to make it happen. A good quality practice session starts before you hit your first ball. You need to make sure that your body is prepared and ready to go so that you can make the use out of your practice time. Especially if you're like me, you spend a lot of time working at the computer, you can't just go from the computer to practicing at a high level, so you have gotta get your body ready. And that's why I include at least three different things as part of my on-court warm-up before I hit any shots. The first one is gonna be footwork. I program in specific footwork patterns that I'm gonna be using during the session or that I'm struggling with and I'm kind of working on generally. So here I'm programming in specific open stance footwork patterns because we're going to be using the open stance when we're attacking those high balls. I'm working on inside out variations and I'm working on variations where I'm moving over towards my forehand side and then in terms of the actual swing pattern or the, the footwork that I'm using through contact I call those swing steps I'm using something called a kickback. So just progressively warming up these movements. I'm also really trying to stay nice and low and kind of have a wide base throughout. I also like to work on improving my coordination or switching on the parts of my brain that deal with creating and coordinating movement. The reason that this is so important is because tennis is all about coordination. It's about being able to use your body in the correct way. And here, the main thing that I'm focusing on is gonna be the sequencing of using my kinetic chain. And you can't do that unless you've got good coordination. And like I said earlier, this is one of the big things that I had to improve in my, my body before I could hit high forehands with my right hand so now I'm doing a lot of work to get the left side coordination and the left lower leg switched on so then I can drive through that left hip to initiate the start of the swing and then I also like to make sure that my visual system is switched on and ready to go because everything in tennis depends on how well you can see and I always used to get too close to the ball and I used to hit the ball late both of those things were caused by not being able to accurately judge distance and depth and speed. With my right hand, I had to fix my visual problems before I could attack these high balls. So again, it's really important now that I'm playing left-handed. So I start by doing a specific drill using a Brock string where I'm making sure that my brain can see the image with both eyes. And that's really important for tracking the ball and your ability to judge how fast things are moving and how far away they are. After the warm-up, I move to mini tennis. And this isn't something that I rush through. Mini tennis is a really important training tool for working on your timing, your footwork, and a number of other different things. So I'm really focusing on trying to meet the ball out in front, but I'm trying to do it as smoothly as I can without rushing my shots. So in order not to rush my shots, I've got to make sure that I start my swing early enough. The other thing I'm really focusing on is being as wide as I can. So I'm being very intentional using a split step in mini tennis, trying to land nice and wide. 
and trying to stay as low as I can throughout my shots. If you watch the best players in the world play, their base is incredibly wide. So the way that they land from their split step is really wide, which allows them to move very quickly in whatever direction they need to. They also stay really low on their shots. So this is something that I'm trying to incorporate within my own game. I work hard on my flexibility so I've got greater range of motion, and then I program it in with mini tennis and throughout the rest of my practice session. The way that you structure your practice sessions is really important because you've got to be working at the right level of difficulty in order to improve. Which is why I'm starting just inside the baseline rather than being all the way back at the baseline. And I've got my ball machine on the service line rather than the baseline. The reason for this is the ball has now got less distance to travel. That makes it easier for me to predict how far the ball is away and how high the ball is going to bounce. Both of which are going to be really important for my timing. So I start by working on a single feed to my forehand side, means I don't have to move much to set, in, uh, set up in position, and then I'm trying to hit it down the line to a target that I've got quite a long way from the sideline, so I'm trying to give myself big margin for error, don't want to be making any unnecessary unforced errors. And then technically what I'm working on is the timing. It's all about loading through my left hip, driving that left hip forward to initiate the kinetic chain, so hip, torso, shoulder and then the racket coming through and trying to do that efficiently relative to the ball that I'm dealing with. So in terms of the important pieces for me, it's the footwork, making sure that I'm right the right distance from the ball because if I get too close that's when I tend to miss hit them and what you'll see is I'm hitting some good shots on some of these but others I haven't hit very cleanly at all and normally when that's uh, that's when I get a little bit too close to the ball so as I move to each shot I'm thinking about keeping the right distance away and I'm trying to initiate the swing by throwing that left hip forwards trying to meet the ball out in front next I work on inside in forehands where again I'm taking them down the line to a big target the focus remains exactly the same trying to make sure I've got the right spacing and distance from the ball and trying to get good timing driving through my left hip so just quickly want to talk about the footwork pattern because this was the one that I was practicing earlier in the uh, previous part of the video I'm loading up in that open stance the reason it's an open stance is so you can then drive up into the ball because obviously the balls up high you're also trying to drive and throw that left hip forwards and because I'm throwing that left hip forwards you'll see that my left leg kicks back and that's why this footwork pattern is called the kickback. The next feed I work on is an alternating feed. So I've just done 200 balls uh, moving out to my forehand then I've done 200 inside in forehands and now I'm alternating between a forehand and an inside in forehand which raises the difficulty in terms of me getting the right distance from the ball. The next progression is with a random feed. So now I don't know whether it's going to my forehand, I don't know whether I'm going to have to move into that inside in forehand position. And again, this raises the level of unpredictability and increases the challenge on my ability to set up the right distance from the ball and to use efficient timing. And then I move back to the baseline where I repeat the process. So now I'm on the baseline. I've also got my ball machine set up on the baseline. So now the ball has a further distance to travel. That increases the challenge for me to predict how far the ball is away from me and to predict how high it's going to bounce, both of which are going to be important for my timing. And then everything else stays the same. I'm trying to land in a wide, stable base, stay low as I move into position, set up the right distance from the ball, and then load and drive through through my left hip to initiate the swing, hopefully getting that nice good contact point out in front. And then it was the same progression, so I've hit 200 balls down the line from my forehand side, I'm now going to hit 200 balls working on my inside in, again hit into a big target with all the same focuses. And then after that I progress through to working on the alternating feeds and the random feeds. So the focus always remains the same. The difficulty element comes in by challenging my ability to remain focused on the thing that I'm working on. The spacing, driving through that hip and getting the nice quality timing. And I was relatively happy with how the training session went. I was definitely getting a little bit tired towards the end, but generally I'm pleased with how things are progressing. Honestly, the high forehand was the bane of my existence when I was a junior tennis player and when I was an adult. Until I fixed my visual system and my coordination, I was just not able to hit the shot. So now that I'm able to start to do it reasonably well left-handed, it's given me a lot of confidence that I'm gonna be able to reach the level that I want moving forwards. 
So that's what my on-court training session looks like. The way that you practice makes a big difference. You've got to be working on the right thing. You've got to be working on it at the right level of difficulty, and you've got to get enough repetitions before you'll improve and be able to use a specific technique within a match. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. But honestly, the majority of my improvements don't happen because of the practice. They happen because of the stuff that I do off the court. Like I said a moment ago, my high forehand was horrible growing up with my right hand. The issue was my visual system, not being able to predict how far the ball was away and how fast it was traveling and not having good enough coordination. And because of that, I would hit the ball late. And when you're hitting the ball late, you don't efficiently use the kinetic chain. And that means you can't generate racket head speed efficiently because of that, you have to force it and you make lots of unforced errors. And that's exactly what I used to do until I addressed the underlying issues with my visual system and with my coordination. And that's why I don't really teach much tennis on court anymore. I teach players how to use neuroathletic training so they can raise their skill level. Because when you work as a coach, you can help players, but you can only help them up until a point. And any coach that's watching this knows exactly what I'm talking about. If you get a fantastic tennis athlete, you can make them an amazing player. But most people aren't fantastic tennis athletes. They've got these limitations within their skill, their vision, their coordination, and that prevents them from improving past a certain point. So now I teach players how to address that side of things because that's what I had to do to fix my own game. Now, if you would like to learn more about about using a neuroathletic training to improve your performance. I've created a masterclass that's gonna teach you all about it. I'll place a link down in the description and I'll place a link up there so you can check it out. Uh, it'll also tell you a little bit about my program and how I work with players if that's something that you're interested in potentially exploring. Okay, hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Hopefully it made sense that on court practice, very you know structured, working on things in a certain way, but all foundational elements. It's just about doing it for long enough until you develop the habit and working on your underlying systems and your off-court time so that you've got the ability to implement the stuff that you're trying to do on court.